So we looked at this video from Earthling Ed about his vegan struggles. I also wanted to check out this one from Jenny Mustard, 16 Years Vegan, My Struggle with Veganism. 486,000 subs, and I've never heard of this channel. I'm constantly surprised, amused, delighted by YouTube and the number of mid-size bigger channels there are that like I've never heard of, that you've never heard of, right? But obviously they've been heard of by lots of people. Like, I don't know, it's cool. I know that the, the vast majority of people on YouTube have no followers, they don't make videos or anything. And then the ones who do make videos have, you know, maybe a couple hundred subscribers. There aren't that many that have thousands of subscribers, but that I still constantly find new people, new channels. I don't know, it's cool. 16 years vegan, quite a long time. I think I'm about to hit, or no, I'm about, wait, <laughs> am I about to hit 16 years? I often get asked if I have like a vegan anniversary. I don't know. I have no idea. I just use my channel start date, like when I started the channel and first published a video, which was June 2009. I know I've been vegan at least that long. Last year, I made a video about my 15 years as vegan and like what they don't tell you about going plant-based for that long amount of time, you know, like the unexpected effects. And no, I can assure you, protein deficiency is not one of them. I feel like I'm not even listening to what she's saying because I'm trying to figure out her accent. <laughs> it's like mesmerizing. What, what is that? Swedish, a Swedish London-based writer. 16 years ago, when I decided to quit animal products, this was like back in what, early 2008? Or was it maybe late 2007 probably? And I was actually, a bit nervous about taking like this big dietary step and I was nervous for three reasons mainly. First of all, I thought I would miss some of my favorite foods like goat cheese, gorgonzola and like Swedish Vesterbotten cheese. Everybody says cheese, right? Cheese was a big thing for me. And then I don't know if I've said this before, but I was also surprised by things that I didn't realize I liked that much that once I stopped eating them was like, oh, wait, like I really want that. One was my mom's beans and rice with sausage. All of a sudden, that was my favorite thing and I miss that so much. But yes, cheese was the big one for me when I originally not quite went vegan. I was doing the eat to live thing for health, Dr. Furman's eat to live book. I don't recommend that book. That's how I got into veganism eventually. Um, but that was like a 90-10 thing, right? It was more eating plant-based, not really veganism. So I was eating mostly plants and then I would have 10% of whatever I wanted. And that was a pretty much a cheeseless diet. That was really hard. And also trying to eat more beans because beans were really important. So I ended up eating mostly grains because I didn't want to eat beans. And then soon after that, I went raw vegan. At that point, like cheese wasn't even the issue. I was cutting out so many things. I was cutting out just chips, you know, <laughs> like vegan junk foods that I don't ever really remember fantasizing or anything about cheese. It was mostly like chips, right? Chips and salsa. That was a huge thing. I really, really wanted some damn chips. And when I would give in and eat some dreaded cooked food, it was often chips. There really aren't raw foods to satisfy that crunchy thing that like cooked chips have and some other cooked foods as well. Like you really can't get that from raw fruits and vegetables. No celery. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about crunchy, watery stuff. Like it's not the same thing. Yes, you can get a dehydrator, but again, it's not the same thing. It gives you a dried out, chewy thing, not a crisp, crunchy thing, you know? So yeah, that, that was the biggest thing for me. Like, holy shit, there ain't no chips. Where are the chips? I had already been vegetarian since I was 11. So really, considering how ridiculously easy I found that step to be when I was 11, I probably should have realized that this next step wouldn't be much harder. Maybe it depends, right? I mean, meat was easy for me to give up if I had just gone vegetarian, which I, I never did. I never made that step. Just going vegetarian, I think would have been pretty easier for me. Again, I might have had the like, oh, beans and sausage, man, you know, but I don't think it would have been such a huge thing. And in the same vein, right, going raw vegan versus vegan, there's like no comparison. Chips are vegan. Plot twist, it wasn't harder at all. I didn't like miss cheese. This was like not of my struggles as a vegan. Shocking to hear, I know. Especially considering that it seems like cheese is the one thing most people worry about when considering going plant-based. And it's 
no surprise really, since I mean, we know that cheese is an addictive food chemically. So yes, cheese is probably hardest to let go of. That is so obviously vegan cheese. <laughs> Whether you can truly say cheese is addictive or not depends on how you use the word addictive or addiction. I've always kind of rolled my eyes at it, but particularly since having a child who has never had real cheese, cow's cheese or goat's cheese or anything, and absolutely loves vegan cheese as if it were cow's cheese. There's no queso morphines in fucking vile life, right? But I swear to God to my kid, it's cheese. In the same way, my middle child, my five-year-old, despises vegan cheese in the way that people who don't like cheese don't like cheese, right? It's got that kind of feedy, funky sort of thing. Like they, no, they don't want anything to do with it. So I think mostly the reason we like cheese is because it's fatty and salty, right? And it has that texture that is so different from really anything else. Even vegan cheese, right? <laughs> vegan cheese has its own special texture. <laughs> oh my god, we recently made pizza. I make the dough and then my husband makes, does all the rest, rolling it out and the poking it with the rolly pokey thing, the dough, you know, so that it doesn't get all the bubbles when you pre-cook the dough. Oh my god. Anyway, we usually use the Miyoko's Pourable cheese. It has the best texture and I forgot just how bad. <laughs> like regular vegan cheese shreds on pizza is until this last time when we ran out. And so we used, I think it was Daya. And I didn't even know, I didn't know we'd run out. I didn't know that he had used the shreds until I took that first bite and it was all stuck to the roof of my mouth and all gummy. And I went, oh no, where's the Miyoko's? What happened? So yes, cheese is probably hardest to let go of for most people. But for me anyway, once you do, it's like, so very much easier than it seemed. I was hoping she was gonna give some tips, like did she find some vegan cheese sauces or something she liked, like some alternatives, or was it just, it was just easier? Because I definitely missed it for a long time, and then I would eat like cheese alternatives a little bit, but really it just took time for my taste buds to change. And now I'm basically like my five-year-old. I really don't like vegan cheese a whole lot, and it's certainly, not worth the calories, honestly. Like if I'm making a sandwich, I don't wanna add that 80 calorie cheese slice on there. I do make a cheesy pasta. It's a Nora Cook's recipe. I think she puts like a half a bag of cheese shreds in there. I think I put three fourths of a cup. That gives it a little bit more flavor and I like that. But um, like I said, just having a bunch of cheese shreds on a pizza, oh. Now I will say I was never into like blue cheese or gorgonzola or anything. My husband loves the the nasty foot cheeses, the blue cheese and shit. But I loved mozzarella. I loved Munster cheese. I loved Gouda. Whereas like now just that smell, that footy smell, like we get vegan stuff. Sometimes we'll get some vegan puffs or something to try. And if it even smells a little bit like cheese, like, oh, so nasty. It's kind of like Trixie Mattel said. I just watched her video, right? Trying vegan snacks. And she tried that one that she didn't like those puffs. And she said, if you've been vegan a long time, you know, maybe this could fool you, right? Maybe this could be cheese-like enough for you. I think that's true. And it's not just cheese either, right? If we look at sugar, again, the Trixie video, she really liked those sugar-free square things and thought they were really good. And then I was like, nah, man. And I wonder if that's because maybe she doesn't eat a whole lot of sugar so it tastes sweet enough to her. Whereas me, I'm eating a bowl of Coco Roos or whatever every single day. I know what candy is. This is not candy. But I'm sure if I stopped eating a thousand grams of sugar every day, it probably tastes pretty good. Might even taste like real candy. The second reason I was nervous was because I thought, or I was convinced actually, that I was making a health sacrifice for the sake of my ethics. Because yes, I am an ethical vegan. I made the decision because I couldn't support the animal industries anymore. After seeing, you know, all the abuse and trauma that we put animals through to get milk and eggs and the rest of it. So I had been bombarded with information telling me that I wouldn't get enough protein, iron, B12, etc. But mostly just protein. Back then there was like an obsession with protein and everyone ate so much of it that I feel like horrible for the kidneys when I think about it. We gotta stop the kidney myth thing. Protein is not bad for your kidneys unless you already have a pre-existing kidney condition. Same for the liver. And that includes animal protein. Look, I would love it if animal protein were really bad for our kidneys and liver, but that's just, it's not what the evidence says. 
B12, I make sure to get as a supplement and vitamin D, especially in like the darker months. But I've tested myself so many times over these 16 years, you know, doing blood tests, and I've never even been close to having a deficiency. Usually doctors tend to like compliment me on my blood, if you excuse me taking a moment to brag here. But I'm not like religious about macro or micronutrients. Like I'm interested in health, but I'm not like a health freak that way. I used eat what feels good. It's so funny to me whenever I see the, the carnivore people talking about how hard it is to get enough nutrients without eating animal meat and animal byproducts. Whenever I plug my food into chronometer, right, just like a breakfast smoothie, some fruits and veggies and hummus and peanut butter for lunch, tacos for dinner, or maybe burgers and fries, maybe some tenders and broccoli, maybe some spaghetti, like whatever I'm making the family for dinner. My popcorn, of course, gotta have my popcorn. Like I get everything I need other than D and B12. Certainly you can make a vegan diet that is very deficient. I talk about a lot of those sorts of vegan diets on this channel, but if you're not eating raw vegan or super low fat or super low carb or something, you're just eating a balanced vegan diet, eating your legumes. I, I don't know, man. It really is not that hard, which is why then the carnivore people have to talk about like taurine and creatine. I actually have a video on that, I think. I want to say a huge thank you to Copilot Fitness. Uh-oh, we got now. My plan was to find a way to build muscles in a way that I didn't hate. So I was aiming for three 30-minute sessions per week, and I am now so into it that I earlier this year asked my coach Heidi to go up to four sessions per week. Oh, I know this is an ad, but that's that's great. And it goes to show that veganism isn't just about health, right? People always assume that you're vegan and you're this health addict and exercise and stuff comes e easy to you, but that's not at all true. I happen to love exercising and I'm very upset <laughs> when I even like miss a day and I regularly work out for an hour a day, sometimes even longer than that. I really shouldn't with three kids and I feel kind of selfish about it, but like my back is so good right now. Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. Point is, I know it's really hard for a lot of people to not only schedule working out, but to actually find that motivation because you just hate it and it's not fun and maybe you don't get that like high afterwards that everyone claims you get after working out. So again, I know it's an ad, but that's great that she's found something that works for her and that she can do and she's actually doing more of, like that's awesome. I was fortunate enough to find what I liked pretty early on. I think I was 16 years old. I wanted to lose weight, of course. That was my motivation, my original motivation. And so I started running and it just felt terrible. Like I, had, I couldn't breathe. My throat was on fire. I hated it. I hated cardio. And then I bought a uh, Kathy Smith DVD and it was weights. And I freaking loved it. From like the first second of the workout, I went, yes, this is awesome. Yeah, then I got into Kathy Friedrich soon after that. And to this day, I am still doing, it's been, I'm not going to say how many years it's been. It's been a lot of years. And to this day, I am still doing Kathy Friedrich workouts. I did one just this morning. And I do love how many different online things there are now, right? When I first started working out, again, many, many years ago. It was like Kathy Friedrich. There was a uh, video fitness, I think was the website where you could buy other fitness DVDs. Comcast or Xfinity, I think it was Comcast at the time that we had, they had like a fitness channel and they had, you know, a, a schedule of workouts playing, right? Mostly like easier stuff, but like YouTube channels with free workouts, that that was not a thing, right? So working out at home, like you could download stuff from the internet. There were websites with plans that you could do, but I wanted video that I could follow, right? I learned very quickly, okay, that's what keeps me motivated. I really cannot work out on my own. It's just, it's terrible. It's so boring. I need that shitty like fitness royalty free music. <laughs> but now like Heather Robertson, she is great. You can just follow her workouts and they are really awesome. They're fantastic for like overall well-rounded fitness and that's all free and she just uses dumbbells. I think maybe she has a few workouts where she uses bands maybe, but it's pretty much all just dumbbells. Caroline Gervin, I don't think she posts anything free anymore. She has an app now, but she has a ton of workouts on her channel that are also really awesome and really whatever style you want, Pilates, yoga, whatever, you can find it for free on YouTube. That's just so awesome.
The third thing I was nervous about, and this is for sure the biggest change that has happened these last 16 years, was the perception of me as a person being vegan, since back then, a vegan generally brought to mind this like militant terrorist releasing minks from mink farms and like bombing slaughter trucks. Granted, I was an ethical or like a political vegan, but I had no plans of making my activism go beyond like talking about it online and you know trying to encourage David to go plant based too, which he did like a few months after me. Oh, back in 08, David and I were the only vegans that we knew. That's such a funny photo. I love that. Both just being swallowed by their clothes. No vegan meat substitute and we had to like go to a very tiny, very smelly organic shop to find tofu. Okay, fortunately I never had to go to a very tiny, smelly <laughs> store to get tofu. <laughs> the faux meats and cheeses and stuff has definitely expanded. I think I always had access to tofu. They always had a little bit of tofu in the grocery store, but that's expanded as well. I think there was some soy milk too, but certainly not almond milk or oat milk, cashew milk, nothing like that. So all the struggles I had, the fear of deficiencies, the difficulty of finding good vegan products in the food shop and at restaurants, and like the perception of vegans and the endless, non-stop, uncomfortable questions at dinner parties as a sort of early adopter, vanguard vegan back then, we had to like reply to so many, quite frankly, ridiculous questions like, what will we do with all the grass? What will we do with all the grass? I don't think I ever got that one. That's the new one for me. Would I eat a pig if I was on a deserted island? Yeah. It's so funny. We just have this innate, like, are you consistent? <laughs> are you being consistent with your values and your actions? Even though we, the person asking, probably not consistent with our values and our actions. Anything to take the heat off ourselves, right? Anything to steer the conversation away from, oh, you're doing a good thing. Maybe that's something I should be doing too. No, 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 no. What bad things are you doing? Let's focus on that. Saying you were vegan, every Joe Schmo was all of a sudden a nutrition scientist with a special expertise in amino acids. This phase of my vegan journey is long since over though. I would say by 2013, 2014, the plant-based boom had happened and like omnivores had simply got used to having us around and seeing firsthand that we were neither anemic or suffered muscle atrophy. And also I think most people just won't say anything because they're nice, right? But I think my favorite, God, I wish I could think of some examples, but I've just been the, the nutrition thing. Like people would just come up with like the weirdest nutrition facts. I heard that if you eat one tablespoon of oats a day, you'll never get cancer. You know, just like the weirdest stuff people will pop out with when you say vegan. Still the one relentless, never ending struggle of my vegan journey. That people still eat a lot of animals. There's still a lot of animal suffering, I assume, is what she's gonna say. The latest estimation I found from 2023, it was estimated that we kill about 92 billion animals every year for food. And that's just the land animals. There's no way of knowing how many fish we kill because they are measured in weight, not in lives. So 92 billion, it's impossible to even have like a response to this, isn't it? And this number is higher than ever before. And for me, the thing I can't stand to think about is not the fact that these 92 billion animals are killed, it's how they are treated from the day they're born until the day they're killed, the conditions they live under and the pain that they go through. So I'm sorry to talk about upsetting things, but my struggle with being an ethical vegan is that even though life has become so much easier for us vegans, it hasn't for the animals. And this is why I'm so grateful for those who do undercover work and actually like do the dirty work and go witness these atrocities and the cruelty and the suffering these animals go through. It's bad enough sometimes not doing that, you know, just being me, living my life. Like I've got a lot of things going on. I'm married. I have three children. Like there's a lot to do. I have a house, you know, it, it's... Most of my life is not focused on veganism. It's not focused on animals. And yet it's still really upsetting. I, I can't imagine being in it, you know, and, and actually being with those animals. I'm just really grateful there are people who will do that. I'm not going to cry. We know that the number one biggest change that us you know, civilians can do for the planet is to go plant-based. The main, main thing is beef, right? And this is something 
I've talked about before, there's been a, a bigger push amongst certain um, vegans, you know, flexitarians, like animal welfare people over the last several years to encourage people to eat beef instead of chicken and fish because of the lives lost. But the, the issue is beef is obviously much worse for the environment. So I pushed back against that a few years ago. I made made a video. Point is, I think we should care about animal welfare and the environment, which means cutting out all animal flesh, all animal byproducts, or at least cutting back dramatically. If you think I'm being sensationalist or exaggerating, feel free to look this up yourself. The images are there. The animal abuse is not like the odd case. It's systemic. The practice of these farms to be like as financially efficient as they are is built on routine abuse. Even in the UK, even in Sweden, who, you know, pride themselves of having one of the best animal welfare legislation in the world, it's worldwide. Very well said. For people who don't really don't want to watch footage, just read, just read about standard practices in confinement feedlots. Just read about standard practices for boiler hens. We're not talking about the workers kicking birds and stomping on them, hitting them with shovels or whatever. We're talking about just standard practices, what workers are supposed to do, how these animals are supposed to be treated. It's horrible. And they do that not because they want to abuse birds and cows and pigs. They want to make as much money as possible. They want to make as much food as possible. And you do that by treating these animals as property, by putting them into confined spaces, growing them as quickly as possible, even if it leads to health conditions and pain. Once you do sit down and inform yourself about what these industries are like and what goes on inside the farms, you can never unsee it. And it will change like your view on humanity, that we can have the cruelty to create an industry this horrific, and that we're still somehow supporting it to go on. I wish that were true, but you know, a lot of people see this footage and they are able to basically ignore it, right? They are able to go back to whatever they were doing. We've got to get to a point where we have meat and cheese and eggs that are comparable in taste, in texture, in price and availability to real quote unquote, cruel meat, eggs, and cheese. People just don't care that much. They don't care enough about the environment. They don't care enough about animals. Even environmentalists, look at the number of environmentalists who are not vegan, who still eat meat, who still eat beef. We just don't care enough. But if you give people the option, if you say, hey, this one is less cruel, far less cruel, which one? They're the same, but one is far less cruel. Of course, they're gonna choose that one. And yes, it can affect your view of humanity learning about these things, but, I think it's also to put it in the proper context, which is that we didn't used to have the abundance that we have today. Factory farms, this happened over a long period of time and the goal was never to abuse animals. It was always to feed people and to support workers, to support farmers, to make money, yes. It's kind of like nutrition, right? Decades ago, the goal was to get people enough nutrients, right? Like the, the issue for Americans was not obesity, it was starvation, right? It was deficiencies that led to health conditions. Well, we're not really in that position anymore, are we? Now the issue for us is obesity, it's excess. But now that we've gotten to this point and we have such abundance and we have a food system that is based on factory farming, um, it's not an easy thing to change, but I don't think it should negatively impact our view of humanity. Yes, we've created this monster, but we're also gonna be the ones to fix it. I have no doubt that factory farming is gonna be a thing of the past. Cheese, I don't miss it. Deficiencies, I don't have them. Physically, I feel better than ever after these 16 years. And mentally, I mean, I've already talked about this in other videos that I'm like striving for a more non-violent life in general because I am like, you know, a tender hearted girl and I abhor violence in all its forms. And of course, like not consuming violence in the shape of food, it makes me feel that much more sweeter and lovelier as a person. I wish I could say the same for me, but no. That was really lovely. I really enjoyed that video. And now I have to go get my seven-year-old from school and maybe give them some cheese. I don't know. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like and subscribe. And thank you so much to my members and patrons at patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. I do post two exclusive videos for tier two members and patrons. I do a vlog and then I also do a controversial topic. I should have that one up next week for this month. Thanks again, guys. New video soon.